So with the release of the new DLC, I've been playing a lot of Elden Ring lately. And earlier this year, I watched a ton of lore videos to figure out what exactly happened to the Lands Between. In these lore videos, I discovered why From Software games are famous for their opaque, slow drip of world-building information, doled out in item descriptions and by obtuse NPCs. There's something deeply compelling about only having half of the story. It forces players to really work to piece together the weird world they're slogging their way through. And like, as much as I hate to admit it, I am also a YouTuber, and I've already done two lore-esque videos for Spire and Heart, so I've been kicking around the idea of doing another lore video on an RPG for a while. And then, at my local game store's RPG book club, we decided to read Wander Home, and I discovered that the team at Possum Creek were employing a similar design philosophy to From Software with regards to the history of their setting. I guess you could say Wander Home is the Dark Souls of tabletop games. But what solidified this decision for me was the release of a Wander Home Director's Commentary in June, as part of Bannerless Games' Disc 2 Jam, a really cool jam in which game designers revisited their old work and created things like deleted scenes or additional commentaries. Thankfully, Wander Home designer Jay Dragon and book designer Ruby Lavin added a deeply insightful annotated version of the game, one which not only provides fascinating insights into the layout and construction of the text, but also makes explicit a lot of the history that was originally obscured. In order to organize these lore tidbits, I've taken it upon myself to construct a theoretical timeline of the Haithlands divided into three very loosely defined ages. On page 7 of the Wonder Home Director's Commentary, Dragon brings up the concept of axiomatic world building. Dragon explains this as, quote, a very fancy way to say that Wonder Home is composed of a set of first principles that all other setting choices are derived from, end quote. Essentially, the lore of Wonder Home comes from these two initial pages, and everything else in the book has to stem from the ideas laid down here. It's proven to be a pretty effective method of developing a world, even in a tabletop text where readers are expected to bring their own interpretations to the narrative. The artwork alone portrays a richly imagined and flavorful locale. But in these first couple pages, we see the cornerstones of a larger universe hinted at, but never fully defined. We get a few proper nouns. The Lightning Dancers, the North Wind God, the Heaven Blade which slew the Slobbering God. Dragon lays out the legends of the Haithland as well, stories of dragons now all reduced to bone, mischievous demons with the heads of fish. But most important of all, we learn that while the Haith is beautiful, and its animal inhabitants are generally kind, it is not a realm without conflict. Quote, the Haithland was recently caught in a war, but it is no longer. There is no violence here anymore. End quote. This stricture against a violence, and the rare exceptions where it may be broken, are probably Wanderhome's most famous mechanical feature. But this little snippet tells players a fundamental truth about this world. That very recently, violence was a part of everyday life. After all, there is no such thing as being unaffected by war. I feel there's enough evidence in the text to imagine a narrative of how we got to this point, this peaceful post-war calm. I tend to follow this trail to its heartbreaking conclusion. But let's start from the beginning, in the age before history, when dragons ruled the skies, and the gods were neither small nor forgotten. Every old mousewife and crusty badger knows stories of the time before time, before conies called themselves kings, back when meteors lit up the sky every devil days. The Haith was a wilder place, feral with the energy of its own youth, and the people who roamed the land found gods appropriate to their setting. We know the wind god hailed from the north. In the Wander Home guest playbooks and natures, you'll meet folks who call the glaciers their home, and they'll tell you, as you fight the biting cold blowing across the lonely horizon, that this was the place the fearsome wind first blew. In the middle of a maelstrom, an old fisher frog might comment that the storm is the north wind's fury, come once again to wreak havoc on the ungrateful kith who have forgotten him. And in fact, there are places in the Haith that have not forgotten him, who still fear his wrath to this day. During the month of monsoon, some communities will still offer sacrifice to the north wind, one I imagine is intended to stave off his fury rather than celebrate his generosity. But the North Wind God is largely a legend these days. The guest playbooks tell us of his palace, once glorious, now lost, drowned beyond the horizon. The brave mouse mentioned in the game's introduction must have dealt the god a thorough defeat. Though sailors know well to honor the wind before a voyage, 
the majority of land-loving kith need not fear his chilly fury. The only tangible memory of this fearsome lord lies with the dancer playbook, who claims to have stolen a reed flute from the god himself. I like to imagine that around the same time as the North Wind God's Peak, dragons lived abundantly in the heath. We actually don't know much about the characters of the dragons in Wanderhome. There's no detail suggesting they were voracious, fire-breathing predators. We just know that they were magical, and, as the intro suggests, they feared a death that came for them all. What we do know, however, is that, even up into the contemporary era of Wonderhome, one can have been a dragon slayer. And I think it is in the descriptions of dragon slayers that we get the most insight into who the dragons were. Dragon slayers and kings are cast in the same mold, hungry for stories and the power they yield. Indeed, the heroic trait in Wonderhome may be ascribed to dragon slayers, but is spoken of with pity. Quote, a heroic kith believes they are the savior of the world. What a cruel fate indeed. End quote. And perhaps the most damning detail about the dragons is found in the crimes of the Vagabond playbook. While the Vagabond's crimes section contains some fascinating implications about justice and legality in the Haith, I think it's undeniable that, textually, dragon slaying is considered a crime in this world. There are a few ways we can interpret what this means for the dragons. Perhaps the dragon slayers are similar to real-world poachers, those who kill elephants and sharks for their supposedly medicinal body parts. The guest playbook The Canvas has dragon bone paints, after all. Perhaps the dragons were treated like big game animals, hunted simply for sport, for thrill and trophies. But I think it's slightly more complicated than that. There are animal analogs in Wanderhome. All insects are textually non-persons, and many are livestock. But the dragons were sentient, and had some sort of relationship with the kith. We know this because of the space they left behind with their deaths. We know a draconic crypt exists because of the ruin nature. Either the dragons buried their own, or the kith helped to bury them. Either way, this suggests dragons had a sophisticated society, one distinct from what we might call animals. We also know that the kith mourned the dragon's absence. In the month of Bloom Meadow, various regions of the Haithland hold, quote, a festival mourning a mythical creature long gone from this place." End quote. While this isn't explicitly a dragon, I think it's a completely fair read to say that the kith still miss their legendary neighbors. Even though the dragons are gone, their presence still lingers. The guest playbook's dreamer class is beloved of the last dragon. They've managed to escape time itself, instead sharing stories with the dreamer while they slumber. The Witch Playbook also communes with the dragons, listening to their voices, making offerings to their souls. Even the humble poet studies their bones, seeking to create a great work in their memory. I don't think I believe that there is some great nobility about being remembered in stories. I think the dragons would have rather lived than been hunted to extinction. But those that sought their annihilation did unintentionally preserve their victims forever. The dragons still haunt the Haith, their memory now a permanent monument to what was lost. The last bit of lore that I think transitions us out of the mythical past of Wanderhome and closer to the next historical era are the legends of the lightning dancers. We know even less about these creatures than we do the North Wind God. It's hard to tell if they even took the form of Kith. The Firelight playbook may travel with a probable lightning dancer as a companion, which suggests they look vaguely bug-shaped. However, the witch claims to have danced with one of these legendary spirits, leaving the handprint scars on their body as a reminder of the encounter. This tale suggests the lightning dancers have a roughly similar body type to the average kith, or at least, their limbs are capable of holding tight to one's shoulder and hip while waltzing in the rain. Perhaps they possess some capacity to shapeshift. And while the director's commentary acknowledges that there's little concrete information known about the dancers, Lavin speculates that they're influenced by the Star Children from Howl's Moving Castle. For the most part, the Lightning Dancers exist far removed from the lives of Kith, occasionally falling from the stars to grant wishes in the bright season. They did, however, take one notable action which shaped the history of the Haith forever. In the Maelstrom nature, we learn that there are stories of how the Dancers once fought a capital B.W. Beautiful War, but it's only in the guest playbooks that we learn, while wandering an old, devastated battlefield, who dared to wage war against the heavens. The last great empress, 
according to old folk tales, was the one who sought to conquer the Lightning Dancers. And I think that title is such a great example of how effective writing does not need more than a few words to convey a ton of meaning. What does it mean for the Haith that it once belonged to a last great empress? Hard to say. We don't know much about her, save that she supposedly once had an estate to spend the month of snow blanket in, though now it's a little more than rubble. But the way I see it, the fact that there were empires at all in the Haith can tell us a little bit about how its more recent eras developed. Empire is a word with specific meanings. To go with a basic dictionary definition, an empire is, quote, a major political unit having a territory of great extent or a number of territories or peoples under a single sovereign authority, end quote. While we never get the sense of the size of the Haithlands, we know it's largely inspired by Dragon's life in the Hudson Valley, a region of about 7,200 square miles, an area of land slightly smaller than the Republic of Slovenia. A sizable territory, but hardly large enough to contain an empire within its own borders. I'm not really interested in debating what counts as an empire, but even those on the smaller side, like the 14th century Serbian Empire, still spanned a landmass 13 times that of my guess at the size of the Haith. I posit that this last great empress had either inherited a nation in which the Haith was but one of many provinces, or the empress sought to increase her greatness by expanding her borders even further. Considering that her name has been largely forgotten in the text, crumbled mansions the only testimony to her power, we can guess that either way, she should not have picked a fight with the lightning dancers. I feel that the legacy of the last empress is important, however, because it allows for the Haith to have an age of monarchy. As the great empire crumbled, presumably because of how bad the lightning dancers whooped its leader, I imagine various regions under imperial authority established their own states. This is a common occurrence following the collapse of empire, from Macedon to Rome to Britain, people reassert control by forming new nations. And while we don't know exactly how, we know that, up into the contemporary period, the Haith is technically a monarchy. Perhaps it started with good intentions, Kith organizing themselves into a unified group to either celebrate their freedom or defend against future encroachments, but as we'll get to later in this essay, nothing good comes of having a king. There's not a lot of information to bridge the gap between the defeat of the Empress and the rise of the monarchy. There are, however, many legends about things much stranger than the whims of the mighty. I propose that in this gray area, between the fall of the Empress and the next terrible war to rack the Haith, there was a time similar to the medieval era of Europe, in which demons and miracles, gods and saints, were rumored to have played direct and significant roles in the lives of everyday kith. Often these legends have a moral component, a parabolic quality meant to teach listeners how to live. This is, of course, all conjecture, but if you would, entertain the notion that, for a moment, the Haith flourished in a time of monsters. I think I didn't catch on my first read-through of Wonderhome that I only discovered when reading the director's commentary, is that, in the Haith, fish are demons. That might be an oversimplification, but nearly every time the word daemon is used in the text, it's often accompanied by a description of its head, which is always based on a type of fish. Draken fleshes this lore out further in the commentary, stating that in addition to having fish heads, daemons likely have the bodies of animal folk, as well as traits of insects, such as wings or chitin. That's very cool, but it also begs the question, do... do the people of Wonderhome go fishing? And the answer is, unequivocally, yes. There's a whole guest playbook class based around fishing, in fact. As we can see from the art of the spincaster, kith are roughly analogous to humans, as far as their size comparison to fish. However, that means that fishing is, in the world of Wanderhome, sort of like farming with a Ouija board. A core detail of the spincaster's background is about how they constantly have run-ins with a pike daemon. That is a wild thing to think about in the pre-industrial society of the Haith. Imagine if every time you went to the grocery store, there was a non-zero chance you got haunted. But the reason I put daemons here in my Wanderhome timeline is because I feel like the proliferation of stories about daemons is somewhat similar to the expansion of the Catholic Church's influence following the fall of the Roman Empire. This is, let me be clear, complete speculation. 
but it makes sense to me that following a period in which an authoritarian state collapses, in the absence of a civic force to compel a certain kind of behavior, legends creep in to fill those gaps. The way that the daemons are discussed in Wanderhome always feels like they're cautionary tales. We know from the miraculous trait that fish can grant wishes, and in the lake nature, we learn the folklore of the salmon with three wishes. This suggests to me that, in a society in which fishing constitutes a significant part of the food supply, people began to develop stories that prominently featured magical fish. And since we know that daemons share the same waters as regular fish, I think it's fair to read their miraculous powers as being inherently tied to risk and greed. Look at some of the titles of other folk tales about daemons. The Eel Daemon and the Lutist, The Bargain of the Flat-Faced Bass Demon, The Opa Daemon's Whispers to the Wandering Prophet, The Maiden and Her Salmon-Headed Daemon Love, and in the guest playbooks, The Trickster Daemon's Final Game. Most of these stories feature not just a daemon, but someone to be tempted or seduced by them. My reference point for demons in our real world is, surprise surprise, informed by Christianity, a religion chock full of people being tempted by demons, including the literal son of God. And across multiple cultures, from Goethe to the Charlie Daniels band, there are dozens of stories about the devil promising power and wealth in exchange for one's soul. So I think it's reasonable to claim that Dragon draws from this history of spirits offering Faustian bargains to inform the character of the demons. However, there is one trickster spirit that doesn't fall neatly into my boogeyman analogy. They're only known by their description, a quote, mysterious stranger with one white eye, end quote. They seem not to be demonic. Indeed, the guest playbooks suggest this stranger is something of an angler themselves. But they seem to have more going on than an above average ability to wrangle catfish. Many playbooks have a special connection with this stranger. They've watched over the caretaker their whole life, they delivered the Guardian their strange charge. They set the Pilgrim on their quest with a brass compass. The Stranger shows up several other times in the guest playbooks, often to provide a kith with a magical trinket of some sort. Dragon states in the director's commentary that there's no hard explanation for what role the Stranger plays, but Dragon imagines them as, quote, being like Odin, some kind of primordial being of trickery and wisdom, end quote. Given that the Norse god Odin famously removed his own eye in pursuit of knowledge, it's a pretty easy comparison. There's not much more to say about the Stranger, save that I think that they're a great tool to deploy in your own games at Wanderhome, a useful figure to shape the future of the Haith in your own games. The reason I include them in this segment about monsters, however, is because their odd behaviors and cryptic gifts are thematically perfect for discussion of Wanderhome's most prominent adversary. The most significant bit of Stranger lore in my opinion, is their relationship with the Ragamuffin playbook. The Ragamuffin, by virtue of starting with some of the most powerful secrets in Wonderhome, is arguably the most important character class someone can choose. And one of those secrets is that they can glimpse the future, and in those flashes, the wide-eyed stranger is always present. Possibly the most notable secret, however, is that the Ragamuffin may inherit the legendary Heaven Blade. I think it makes sense, then, to intertwine the fates of the stranger, the Ragamuffin, and the Slobbering God. I feel that the Slobbering God's rise and fall is closer to the current era of Wonderhome than my so-called Age of Legends, simply because she's more culturally entwined with the Haith than the Lightning Dancers or North Wind God. It makes sense that there's more evidence of the Slobbering God's impact than that of the Last Great Empress, simply because less time has passed to allow the Kith to forget it. There are many legends about the Slobbering God, of her binding, of the Immorality Feast, even the supposed location of her body. There are those that still seek her desecrated temple, or those who'd track down her scattered bones. But I think the piece of evidence that suggests the slobbering god roamed these lands more recently than most of the dragons is that, in the grasping season, there's a whole holiday devoted to its memory. I actually love the Nameless Day, not just because it's so well written, but because it gives us a ton of insight into who the slobbering god was. Quote, in rare and cursed places, no one speaks on the last day of silt. The slobbering god might be long dead, but she is not yet forgotten." End quote. This suggests that only certain parts of the Haith have this kind of connection to the slobbering god, areas which, I assume, were most profoundly affected by her influence when she was still alive. This is a holiday about fear, defense, 
one that replaces the celebratory holiday of Candle Feast with something out of a quiet place. There is a creeping sense of dread throughout the day, a sense of being hunted, even when you're certainly alone. Players must spend a token to remind each other that the slobbering god is dead, that she can't hurt you. This is such a great touch. I love that it takes effort to tell everyone the devil's not real. It speaks to the strength of memory and stories, that successfully convincing others to not be afraid requires an expenditure of energy that wouldn't be necessary if that fear wasn't justified. And just look at the traditions of the Nameless Day. Doors are locked, knives are secreted under pillows, scapegoats and bug meat are left within reach, an offering that one's household might be spared. I know the ablution holiday is textually based on Passover, but between the whispered prayers and the symbols painted on walls, I feel like there's another parallel to be made here, that the kith also seek deliverance from a spirit of death. Based on these hints, what can we conclude about the nature of the slobbering god? Clearly it was a creature to be feared, else she would not have inspired such creepy holidays. From her name, from the stories about her holding feasts and drinking contests, and this incredible illustration by Dominique Ramsey, we can assume she was a being of consumption, a predator at the top of the food chain. See how she towers above the trees? How she nearly blots out the moon? She's absolutely the stuff of nightmares, a ravenous beast, more draconic than the actual dragons in the text. Like the dragons, the slobbering god, too, was slain. We only know that the kith who slew it had no name. Perhaps they were the same mouse who routed the north wind god, perhaps they were an incarnation of the mysterious stranger from a previous era. The only concrete bit of information we know about the defeat of the slobbering god is that she was smote by the heaven blade, a sword of incredible power. There's not even a concrete understanding of how the blade came to be. Some smithies will tell you they know the very furnace where it was forged, but watchful amphibians will swear it emerged from the lagoon across the way. Whatever its origins, they matter little now. The blade is lost, having left ruin in its wake. This last bit is very important, that the heaven blade is not an Excalibur or an Anduril, but one of Damocles, and the immeasurable wound heroism leaves in its seekers. More not for the lost heaven blade, but for its nameless wielder, and the child who secretly keeps it sheathed. Perhaps too, shed a tear for the slobbering god herself. When the moon is high and the night is cold, the witch still hears her grieving spirit, and offers what comfort they are able. So ends the Age of Monsters, with the dragons vanquished, daemons relegated to fables, and the slobbering god laid to rest, a kind of status quo settled over the Haithlands. It's much easier to administer land, establish trade routes, and develop infrastructure when there's no threat of long-toothed titans destroying your hard work. From this time of calm, resources and wealth would be more secure, and as wealth tends to do, would pool in the pockets of the powerful, allowing them to accumulate influence. Perhaps the nationalistic surge I suggested earlier crested with the defeat of the slobbering god, culminating in the establishment of a kingdom. Or perhaps, the rich and powerful squabbled amongst themselves until one of them claimed the right to call themselves the richest and most powerful. Nothing in the text confirms my theories. But however arbitrary my division of the Wanderhome timeline, I think the biggest criticism you might level at this structure is that the Age of Monsters ever ended. They just go by other names these days. I've already laid out my theory that the various monarchs who seized power across the Haithlands rose as a result of the defeat of the last great empress. And while daemons undoubtedly still persist in the Wonderhome setting through the current era, I figured they'd become less common following the fall of the slobbering god. Most daemons are wily enough to go to ground when someone wielding a heaven blade is skulking about the land. But as far as textual evidence that we've entered a new era of the Haith goes, I'd say the game pays significant attention to the role royalty plays in the lives of average kith. Monarchs are mentioned as a class of person you might meet pretty early in the book, the exile has been banished by a royal, and the veteran's sword can be passed down through generations of rulers. I also point to the existence of the royal trait and palace natures as implications that many different kings, queens, and nobles are lounging about. In the game's various folklores, we learn the names of some of these rulers. The Golden King, the Hyena King, the Giant King, the First Queen. 
The first queen is interesting because it suggests that there was, indeed, a kith who pioneered the development of monarchy in the Haith. And due to the number of named rulers who succeeded her, it seems like the trend caught on. The thing about rulers, especially in this game, is that they, by virtue of being so, kind of suck. If it wasn't already clear in the examples and stories I've shared, Wanderhelm takes a pretty firm stance on concepts like violence, glory, and sovereignty. In fact, Dragon states outright in the commentary that Dragon is not interested in framing stories around conflict and domination. I recognize that by making a video with a theorized historical timeline based around imperialism, I am going against this game's core philosophy, and for that I am very sorry, but a tiger can't change his stripes. So when you encounter a royal character in Wanderhome, you can be certain the meeting will be unpleasant. Monarchs are petty, displaying their limited power frivolously, often for the sheer pleasure of showing off their strength. However, the text mechanically requires you to spend a token to resist their broad authority. Just because a ruler's agency is relatively limited, compared to a band of average kith, a king can be as terrifying as any daemon. There is one named king who stands out, to me, above all other characters in the world of Wanderhome, the personification of what the book hates about the powerful. The King of the Floating Mountain is literally the first named character in the game, appearing both in the game's introduction as well as on its back cover. But aside from labels in the art guide and index, he's only mentioned six times throughout the game. I think it speaks to the strength of Wanderhome's construction that even with so little detail, we can devise a whole tragic narrative surrounding this figure and the devastation he unleashed which brought the Haith to its current era. We know a few concrete facts about the King of the Floating Mountain. From Kama Joda's illustration, we could assume he is a rabbit, and judging by the items at his feet in the drawing, we can guess that he is both wealthy and powerful. This image, with its bright highlights of the king at the peak of the mountain, and its flaming borders, suggests a figure of terrible importance, one capable of great destruction. We also know the king is still kicking around. He's an active figure in the current Wonderhome setting. The moth tender carries a summons to the floating mountain. The introduction says your characters have the opportunity to argue directly with the king. But that's as far as solid evidence about the nature of the king goes. There are many legends about why the king is the way he is. Perhaps he was once a golden king, who sadly lost his heart. Perhaps his queen ripped a hole in the world, and the aftermath warped him into cruelty. Or perhaps, the king was always enamored with power, fascinated by the process of controlling others. Why else would he covet a ring, one now in possession of the ragamuffin, one writhing with 99 vengeful daemons, above all other treasures? The director's commentary actually highlights that the ring of 99 daemons is connected to the labyrinth nature, one that began its life as a prison. None of this is textual, but I don't think it's too hard to imagine a king who kept a secret maze in the depths of his floating home, one which contained within its walls a veritable demonic army, Minos, but with fish. The rest of what we know about the king's character can be inferred by the histories of how people responded to his reign. If you leaf through the Wonderhome playbooks, you'll find that of the 15 original playbooks, a third of them have the option to carry a pink orchid, a symbol of a revolution that character was once a member of. The story of the Pink Orchid Rebellion is, more than the extinction of the dragons or the terror of the slobbering god, the darkest part of Wanderhome's history. And due to the frequency with which it appears in the text, as well as the number of playbooks who were directly involved, I feel fairly confident in saying this was the war that the Haithland was recently caught in, as stated in the introduction. This is the last, most important entry in the Wanderhome timeline. There's not a specific reason why the rebellion kicked off. God knows that owning a ring stuffed with 99 daemons certainly would have justified action. But I think we can also infer a little bit about the rebellion's motivations by looking at their symbol. We know there is existing folklore about an orchid goddess, so there could absolutely be a religious component to the revolution. However, Draken specifically calls out the song Bella Ciao in the director's commentary citing a childhood love of the story of the Italian anti-fascist resistance in the Second World War. The beautiful flower in the lyrics ended up becoming the rebellion's pink orchid. 
Bella Chow began as a work song in the 19th century, but its lyrics were adapted in the 1950s following the successful Italian resistance against German occupation to reference the partisan brigades which fought the Nazi invaders. Italian anti-fascist organizations had existed as early as the 1910s, when the extreme right first began its cancerous growth in Italy. When Germany sought to punish Italy in 1943 for signing a peace deal with the Allies, these anti-fascist groups joined forces with former Italian army units to wage a guerrilla war from the mountains, and eventually defeated the Nazi puppet government in a general uprising in 1945. Given the historical basis of Wanderholm's rebellion, we can make some assumptions about the character of the king they fought against. While I think it's too far to say that this rabbit is a Nazi, I think we can broadly extract themes of oppression, violence, and ideologically motivated subjugation from his historical analogs. We also get a little insight into what the rebellion was like by looking at the guest Rebel playbook, written by Riley Rethal, author of Galactic 2E, a game entirely about resistance against space fascists. The Rebel allows players to describe people they met previously on their journey, and through these people we can sketch the shape of the conflict. We know there were various ideological divisions and factions, judging by the ex-lover who couldn't reconcile with your politics, and the revolutionary scholar who once replied to your letter. We know very few were spared the effects of the war. You can have inspired a teenager to take up arms against their town. You can have met an orphan who also hoped for a better future. I also really like the golem, quote, created to protect a town in the days of old, end quote. Since the rebellion happened closer in the timeline, I believe the golem predates this particular conflict, but was brought back into service to defend its neighbors once more. I know Wanderhome prohibits violence during play, but Draken states, both directly in the director's commentary and implicitly in the world building, that the Haith has not been free from violence. War may come again. The point of the rule is to show that, at least for now, there is peace. There's no doubt that the war did end. Former Pink Orchid revolutionaries wear their flowers and memories close to their hearts, but the game does not conceal the fact that their battle was lost. In Nuria Tamarit's illustration of the last leader of the rebellion, we can already see the emptiness in her eyes. She stands atop the bodies of the fallen, surrounded by the panoply of war. But this is not a portrait of the victorious hero, but a picture of someone who cannot escape death. Perceptive viewers might have noticed I haven't provided any textual evidence tying the Pink Orchid Rebellion directly to the King of the Floating Mountain, but I've been pretty confident in saying that he was the revolution's primary antagonist. That's because I wanted to end here, with the alternate holiday at the end of the year, called Bloody Night. This holiday stands in stark contrast to the hopeful New Year's celebrations. Quote, you cannot lionize those who died for a useless cause. End quote. Traditions are mournful and angry. Destroying statues, symbolic war paint, orchids on graves, sobbing. This is a time to grieve. In holiday-specific actions, we see that players can earn tokens by recalling something difficult, and conversely, spend tokens by acknowledging those they've lost to violence. Here, at the very end of the list, we see the undeniable proof of the king's guilt and that his is the name cursed throughout this somber day. It's kind of sad, once it's all been laid out, to see the struggles the hate has endured, the beautiful things that it's lost. The dragons are gone, their murderers still walking proud. The heaven blade, once thought to be a tool of salvation, only ended up another testament to the horrors of violence. And here, arguably the last historical entry in the text, we learn what became of those who dared to dream of a future without kings. The intro tells us that the mighty are now, quote, exceedingly rare, but that is cold comfort to the ones who remember the dead. Wanderholm's philosophy on violence is a strange thing, one which Dragon takes pains to clarify in the director's commentary. This is not a game that is uninterested in violence. In fact, I think the lore we've laid out shows that it is deeply interested in conflict, war, and the ways harm and injury come to all in the wake of those things. But a casual reader might look at this history and conclude that the game believes violent struggle, even when justified, is useless. But Dragon states in the commentary that, quote, It's possible the violence committed was a necessary evil to make the Haith what it is today. The horror of that violence is completely independent from the emotional morality of that violence. 
good people can still have blood on their hands, and you still have to recover from what that blood did to you. End quote. I think that's my largest takeaway from this dive into Wanderholm's hidden lore. This is a game about mending what was broken by history. The text rejects notions of narrative. It is intentionally framed as a journey, not a story with carefully plotted valleys and peaks. And in the journey of the Haith, from its mythic past to its post-war recovery, we are lucky enough to find ourselves in a time of peace. The threat of violence still looms over your head as surely as the floating mountain itself, but Dragon is more interested in getting as close to that threat as possible, without ever following through, because with that prohibition, there is space for a different kind of narrative from the one the Haith has known for so long. It is up to players to heal from the traumas inflicted by those who sought immortality in stories and build a new, kinder history in the paths they travel together. Thanks everybody for watching. I really appreciate anyone who takes the time to see what I'm saying about tabletop games. Uh, also, if you had questions about the outrageously clickbaity YouTube thumbnail, uh, just know that Jay did say it was okay for me to do it, so um, it's fine. If you want to help me keep the channel going, you can send me a tip at my Ko-Fi in the video description. My background picture is Liquified Image by Adrian on Unsplash, and my profile picture is by Eater Outsider on Tumblr. If you want to find more of my work, I'm at AAVoy on Blue Sky, Monster Factory fanfic on Tumblr, but my main site is aavoid.com, where I talk about games and writing. I also do a podcast, Mortified the Friendship Quest, where me and my friend Layla do critical media analysis, uh, and we just talked about the indie game, How We Know We're Alive. So if you like uh, sad point-and-click adventures, uh, please go ahead and check that out. Thanks again, as always, for watching. Uh, until next time, see ya.